National Steering Committee. So let's have one minute of reflection. Right at the beginning of my talk, I have to acknowledge uh, the fact that the reason I'm talking to, to you at all about dielectric relaxation spectroscopy is because of Professor Bartle, because I heard him give a lecture at what I think was, if I remember correctly, the second solution chemistry conference, uh, the 20th in our series, uh, uh, in uh, Ottawa. Uh, and he gave a talk, and I thought that's a wonderful technique. We should see more of it. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you uh, from a solution chemist perspective. I'm not a spectroscopist. I'm certainly not a physicist, uh, and uh, uh, but uh, I am, or have been, in collaboration, in particular, with uh, Richard Buchner. Uh, who was uh, one of Professor Bartle's PhD students and uh, is still currently a member of staff at the University of Regensburg. A number of people were involved in that. Uh, I won't repeat the names now. Uh, and of course, we need to thank the people who fund us, in our case, uh, the Australian Research uh, Council and the uh, DFG in Germany. Uh, and uh, in our case, uh, some very generous funding from the international alumina companies. Up the wrong way. Okay, that out of focus picture of Australia is just to remind you where I'm from. Uh, I'm from Perth on the west coast. Perth is the only 
significant city in the western two-thirds of the country. Uh, it has a population of about two million, so perhaps a little bit similar to Jining. Uh, and we are on the same time zone as China. Uh, so normally uh, when I come to China, I don't suffer from any jet lag because we're flying in real time. Uh, Perth has a very nice climate, um, so-called Mediterranean climate. We have warm, wet winters uh, and hot, dry summers. Okay. Start off by saying a few words about dielectric relaxation and spectroscopy, dielectric relaxation in particular. It's the measurement of the complex response to an applied electrical signal. No electric chemistry involved, just a small electrical signal uh, and you measure the response. In fact, you measure uh, a total response which consists of uh, two parts. The uh, in-phase component, the permittivity, E dash, as a function of the frequency and the out-of-phase um, response, which is a measure of the dielectric loss, which is, if you like, the amount of uh, electrical energy that gets consumed by the sample. You transmit an electric field through a sample by three means. The first two, down the bottom there, are the polarisation of the uh, electron clouds. Second, the movement of the ions, if present, and I'll be mainly talking about electrolyte solutions um, because that's my particular interest. Um, and most importantly of all, and the response that is of interest in, I like this bouncing ball, I must say, um, uh, the most important part is the reorientation of electric dipoles in the magnetic field. This is what you are actually measuring in um, oh. Right. Most of you will not be familiar with dielectric relaxation, so let me explain it to you. Um, in fact, you already know all about it, all that's important, uh, because uh, um, you have either done first year chemistry, or maybe even school chemistry, or you have taught it, even if you didn't do it yourself. Okay, so let's look at there we go. Let's look at the behaviour of a set of dipoles in an electric field. Here is our uh, electric plates. Our electric field is applied across the plates. Um, and our dipoles uh, with uh, negative and positive ends. If there's no field applied, the dipoles are randomly distributed. Let's apply the electric field. And now the dipoles line up, more or less, with a little bit of randomness due to the thermal motion of the dipoles. Okay. Now let's reverse the field. The dipoles will rotate in the field, which is now has the opposite polarity to what we started with. And the dipole species, again, align themselves with the field. Now think about the effects of the frequency of the applied field. Up the top there, let's have a very slowly oscillating electric field. So here's our electric field, plus minus. Here's our dipole aligned with the field, a little bit perturbed by thermal motions. We reverse the field, the dipole rotates in the field. Here it is, rotates until it faces in the opposite direction, again aligned with the field, again slightly randomised by uh, thermal motions. Now let's go to a rapidly oscillating field. Here we are here. We start off with the same field as above. We change the field direction and the dipole begins to rotate, but now we're making the field change very quickly and when it does that, the field reverses before the dipoles have a chance to realign themselves. That's 
dielectric relaxation. Okay? It's the inability of the dipoles, which are the main method of transmission of the electric field through the material, uh, it's their inability to move fast enough to keep up with the electric field. That is the permittivity drops and that's dielectric relaxation. Okay, I've said it's an old but a new technique. It's old in the sense that it was developed in the 1940s about the same time as NMR spectroscopy. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it was set up by uh, various people. Uh, there's no one particular inventor, but uh, uh, they were using old army surplus uh, radar equipment uh, left over from the Second World War um, and uh, started off what I would call the heroic era of uh, dielectric relaxation because the amount of work they had to go to to get a single spectrum would often take weeks to get a single spectrum. Now, of course, you can do it in, with the press of a button in a few seconds. Uh, but it's a new technology in the sense that, uh, oops, uh, in the sense that uh, you need uh, lots of uh, different types of apparatus to cover the whole range. Uh, the range of interest in general is in the gigahertz region, the microwave region of the spectrum, of the electromagnetic <laughs> spectrum. Uh, and uh, you need, uh, unfortunately, uh, unlike NMR, we just have a single machine, press the go button. Um, uh, with uh, dielectric relaxation, you need different instruments for different uh, parts of the spectrum. Uh, you'll note that there's a little bit of a technological gap uh, between here and here. That technology gap, as you will see, has been partly um, solved, but it still remains a very difficult area, but unfortunately a very interesting area of the spectrum that we should be looking at. Um, DRS is mathematically complex. That's a tongue-in-cheek comment, uh, of course, because you need complex algebra to describe the uh, two effects. Uh, and one of the main differences between dielectric relaxation and NMR spectroscopy is dielectric, the invention and development of dielectric relaxation was done by many people and there has been no Nobel Prize. Okay, I'll skip through the instruments. I don't think you need to worry about that. Uh, let me very briefly talk through some of the DRS strengths because I will highlight these as I'm going through. Um, first is the time scale. Um, second, it's able to yield a great deal of information, thermodynamic, kinetic, sometimes, sometimes, even structural information. It provides solvation numbers and tells you things about the solvent that no other technique will tell you. Um, it is the technique for the quantitation of iron pairs, particularly uh, when you have uh, the different types of iron pairs, the solvent separated and so on. I'll talk about that in some detail. It is the only technique that has the sensitivity uh, which is greater for the solvent separated iron pairs than for the contact iron pairs. And the other thing that is unique about DRS is it is the only technique to measure uh, the um, electric permittivity, the dielectric constant of a conducting material, the only way. Okay. All right, so let's also talk about some of the weaknesses. Uh, one of the irritating things, I don't know how you find it, but one of the irritating things I find in science is people who are everlastingly telling us about how good the things that they use or uh, instruments that they build are and never bother to tell us about uh, the weaknesses and of course one group is as important as the other. So the weaknesses of DRS are uh, certainly compared with NMR spectroscopy it is not very species selective. The modes are broad so you usually get overlaps. Um, solvents, all the, most of the solvents are in, of interest are dipolar 
water being the best example. Um, and so you get a very large uh, solvent contribution, of course, because you have more solvent than anything else. Um, and we have some uh, specific techniques. We only see uh, dipoles, uh, so we don't see non-polar species. Now that can actually be an advantage, um, and so too can the solvent contribution, because I will show you later on how we uh, actually get useful information out of that. This slide contains a lot of information and there'll be a short quiz later uh, because I want you to remember quite a few things about it. Um, the first is, this is a typical spectrum. Here's, here's the overall spectrum going along there. And the first thing, of course, is the dominance, in this case, of the water spectrum. There's so much more solvent present that water, the solvent dominates the spectrum. So you have to know very well what it looks like. The second thing is that there's a relatively um, smaller contribution due to iron pairs. This is where we see the iron pairs down here, typically. The desired quantity is uh, the uh, permittivity, the complex permittivity, but in fact all we can measure is the total complex permittivity, uh, eta um, rather than uh, epsilon, uh, and that creates problems because eta consists of two parts. It consists of the dielectric part, which is this part, and it consists of the electrical con uh, conductivity contribution. And you can see that at low frequencies, the electrical conductivity contribution swamps the iron pairing contribution, and you can no longer get useful information. Uh, there are two uh, spectra that you observe here. It's the in-phase spectrum and the extrapolated value gives you your dielectric constant. Uh, and here is the loss curve. I'll often present loss curves because they look more like a spectrum that people are used to. Okay, so what do we do? Well, let's have a closer look at water for a few seconds. Um, the spectrum of water is very well characterised and very well known, although it is relatively recently, uh, because of that technological gap, that this very small relaxation here um, has been identified. It's, it's commonly assigned to the rotation of three water molecules inside the complex network of water molecules, um, uh, although that's controversial and there are other explanations around it. Uh, and you can see that most of the range of interest is covered by the contribution the bulk of bulk water, bulk water dipoles. Okay, so let's begin a few, whoa, <laughs> before I fall off the Pope, <laughs> let's begin a few lessons. So, first lesson that I want to convey that dielectric relaxation spectroscopy tells us about is that all electrolytes are associated to some extent. Of course, if it's sodium chloride, the extent is almost nothing. If it's magnesium sulfate, the extent of association will be very large. Okay. So, but just if you think that the fact that weak iron pairs uh, or weak iron association is not important. You can see here, uh, if we look at this equilibrium, if you put in uh, an association constant of one, that is to say that log k is about zero, then and do a back of the envelope uh, calculation, you'll find that even a salt like sodium chloride is quite highly iron paired. Paradoxically, it's very difficult to detect those very weak iron pairs. It seems, it seems incomprehensible, but that is how things are. Now, it happens that because iron pairs uh, have a large dipole moment, DRS is quite sensitive to them. Here's a typical non-associated electrolyte, sodium bromide, 0.35 molar at 25 degrees, and Here's our overall spectrum. That's the, the data points there. Again, as you see, nearly all of it due to the water 
and a very, very small iron pair contribution, very small because this is essentially a non-associated electrolyte, as you would expect. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the last uh, 20 years, it's been realised that as well as the iron pair contribution down at this region, there's a small effect due to iron cloud relaxation, well-known effect from the 1920s, uh, referred to as the Dubai Falcon Hugging effect. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any means of separating those two things out. So we know that while we there is a little bit of iron pairing down here, there's also this iron cloud relaxation. Right. Lesson number two, the nature of those associated species. Iron pairs were believed, are believed, uh, following the work of Eigen and Tan, for which uh, Eigen, uh, part, of, part of Eigen's work that, uh, for which he uh, gained the Nobel Prize, study of very fast reactions, and Eigen and Tan back in 1962, on the basis of incomplete evidence, uh, postulated a three-step process. They were, in some senses, lucky, in some senses, smart, uh, because the only process, process that they saw was this process and this process. They did, their apparatus wasn't good enough to see that process. <coughs> Excuse me, but they inferred it. And it turned out they were, they were very quickly confirmed that they were right. So what happens when ions come together is they initially come together. Here are our free ions here with their hydration sheaths. Uh, and they come together to initially form a double solvent separated ion pair. That's what that 2SIP stands for. The 2S tells you two solvent molecules in between the <clears throat> the ions, here's our cation, our anion, and two solvent molecules in between. Subsequently, you lose one to get a se solvent separated ion pair, SIP, in which there is one um, water molecule between the two ions. And finally, the last uh, molecule of water intervening can be kicked out, and you get a contact ion pair where the cation and the anion are indirect. You'll notice that the hydration sheath is still there. It, of course, changes quite dramatically as the ions come closer together. Okay, so step one down here, the three hydrated ions come together to form a double solvent separated ion pair. Where are we? Okay. Step two, the double solvent separated ion pair loses a water. Step three, the second water is lost and you form a contact ion pair. As I mentioned before, DRS is one of the few experimental techniques. There are really only two. Probably there is, somebody can tell me there's another, but the two are dielectric relaxation and ultrasonic absorption. Ultrasonic absorption is also developed by Eigen. Um, <coughs> Uh, the advantage of DRS is that it de 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 detects the species. Ultrasonic absorption detects the equilibrium and you have to infer the species. But not only that, but dielectric relaxation, as I've already told you, has a unique sensitivity. With techniques like NMR, you almost can never see these species. You can only ever see this species. So it's very special. The reason that dielectric relaxation has this sensitivity is because the amplitude, the, if you like, the intensity of the relaxation process uh, is proportional to the square of the dipole moment. Di um, iron pairs have very large dipole moments. The bigger the iron pair, the greater the dipole moment, the greater the intensity, hence the sensitivity is in, lies in this way. The only technique for which this is true. Okay, 
So let's go and have a look at a case study in relation to a system that is well ironed bed, magnesium sulphate. Now, you can assume that there, as uh, Pitzer and uh, his colleagues uh, showed back in the 70s, you can assume that there is no complex formation. Indeed, uh, some very well-known people uh, whose uh, scientific credentials I would uh, <coughs> applaud have said there's no evidence for any iron association in magnesium sulphate. What was the basis for saying that? Well, you can model it with a Pitzer equation and it doesn't have any iron association constant in it. However, just one slot, well, a few slight problems. All of these techniques, all of them, show that there is iron association and that it has a value of around about log K of 2.3. Then you'll see I've said, anyway, pits are cheap. Now that's a very big statement to make about one of the best physical chemists of the 20th century. I'm not implying anything to him personally, but it has become apparent, if you look at Pitzer equations carefully, inside one of their adjustable parameters is something that is closely related to an equilibrium constant. So in fact there is a pseudo-equilibrium constant hidden inside the Pitzer equations. So of course you can model the properties without uh, an equilibrium constant. So that's what the dielectric spectrum of <coughs> magnesium sulphate looks like. Here's our usual <coughs> massive water contribution and pretty large iron pair contribution, which can be decomposed into all three iron pair types. Not only that, but we can, as we can get the concentrations of all three iron pair types, uh, we can evaluate the stepwise equilibrium constants, Kr. And if you do your mathematics, you can show that the thermodynamic uh, association constant is given by that expression. Well, how does it all hang together? It doesn't like to change. I have to start using that. Okay, so um, not only <coughs> is there evidence uh, for uh, the association of magnesium sulphate, but we find, and I think I've actually skipped over, yes. Right, thank you. <coughs> From our dielectric measurements, we first of all find that our values for the equilibrium, the stepwise equilibrium constants, are equal to those that were obtained by a completely different technique, ultrasonic absorption. Furthermore, you can show that the concentrations of the contact iron pairs, which are not, for which you do not need the other uh, association constants, is the same in other techniques. And lastly, and most importantly, the value for the association constant that we get is equal to what you get from traditional thermodynamic conductivity measurements. And I make the point there, that if you're doing measurements with a fancy technique, that's great, but don't forget that there's a hundred years of careful thermodynamic investigation, and if your results don't turn out to be consistent with that, then almost certainly there's a problem with your results not with the thermodynamics. No less a person than Albert Einstein said that he thought that of all the scientific theorems that he'd come across, only the theory of thermodynamics would last. That's a fairly big statement. Okay, so our conclusions then, that the eigentan mechanism is confirmed, we didn't discover it, it's confirmed, uh, and it's confirmed quantitatively 
three-step mechanism exactly matches up with the uh, value that you obtain by um, <coughs> dielectric, uh, by traditional methods. Okay, I now want to talk a little bit more about dielectric relaxation versus other techniques. If you look at the Raman spectra of uh, aluminium sulfate, um, you get a spectrum that looks like this. This is work by Rudolf and Mason. Uh, and the uh, spectrum to focus on is probably this, uh, this one in the centre, a little bit smaller. And you can see there's a, a big peak and a little peak on the side. And if you deconvolute those and do the usual analysis, then you get an equilibrium constant from the Raman spectroscopy of about log k equals 0.1. You can do the same thing by NMR. Few people have had a look at it. Uh, here's a beautiful set of NMR spectra. Here's the aluminium, the equated aluminium spectrum, various <coughs> concentrations, that's why it's going up and down. And here's this little tiny peak here. This is the contact iron pair. Do the usual analysis and you get the same value for the log K. That's great. End of story. Two techniques, Raman spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy, give us the same result. Just one small problem. All the traditional techniques, particularly conductivity and potentiometry, tell us in fact that log Ka, the overall association constant, is around about four. In other words, there's just a slight discrepancy of five orders of magnitude between the log K values calculated by the spectroscopic methods and by the traditional methods. Fortunately, uh, DRS can solve that problem. There are a couple of spectra there of what aluminium sulfate looks like in the dielectric spectrum, and you can see that there's a very, very large iron pair contribution, starting to get up even towards the uh, solvent contribution. And when we analyse uh, our spectra, then what we find is indeed that we get stepwise constants for the two solvent separated, solvent separated in contact, and again using that equation that I gave you before, we get the right value for the <coughs> equilibrium constant. And again, I remind you that this must be so. If it isn't so, then you have a problem. You can't just ignore uh, the existing information. I mentioned as one of the weaknesses of uh, dielectric relaxation that um, it's not an ideal uh, technique, it lacks uh, the molecular, molecular specificity of Raman and NMR, um, but occasionally there are some exceptions. Um, this is a particular favourite one of mine. Um, here you'll see um, that the uh, iron pair contribution actually far exceeds the solvent composition in 0.8 molar uh, scandium sulphate. Um, and not only that, but we were able to show that this big iron pair contribution here was due to facial, uh, there are two possible isomers, facial and mer uh, meridinal, uh, and if you do the mathematics, the facial um, structure, I said we sometimes get structural information, the facial structure uh, is um, consistent with the amount of uh, absorption, uh, and the meridional one is not. So a, a, an example where we've got uh, structural information as well as speciation information. All right, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, um, kinetics. I have enough trouble with thermodynamics, but I will just point out that uh, dielectric relaxation is a good technique for studying uh, kinetics of very fast reactions in the nanosecond to picosecond range. Um, of course, only not all systems uh, uh, lend themselves to a kinetic analysis, but when you can, you can get very useful information. I'd like to spend a little time talking about iron hydration. Now, you've already seen that you have this huge solvent contribution to the spectrum. You can actually use that 
contribution to tell you something about hydration. Now, hydration is both ubiquitous everywhere in solution and it's also supple. But DRS can give us some useful information. We would expect to see a continuum of effects ranging from strong to weak interactions between dissolved species and the solvent. In fact, DRS detects two broad types, well, under favourable circumstances, it detects two broad types of uh, water molecule, uh, the so-called irrotationally bound water. This is where water is strongly bound to uh, the solute, so strongly that it can't rotate in the magnetic field, in the electromagnetic field, and it disappears from the spectrum. And also, what we what we've termed slow water, where the ratio, where the rotation of the molecules is sufficiently slow that you can distinguish it from bulk water. Not only uh, is there slow water, but you can distinguish two types of slow water, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. <coughs> hydrophilic hydration occurs uh, when you have attraction, just a straightforward attraction between the uh, positive or negative end of the dipole and the positive or negative, the negative or positive uh, ion for the present. Uh, you can, in fact, quite simply define uh, an effective hydration number, which will give you the symbol ZIV, and it's simply the amount of disappeared water. This is the analytical concentration here. This is the amount of water that we see remaining in the spectrum, divided by uh, the concentration of the solute, so that tells you the number of water molecules that have disappeared per solvent uh, uh, unit. Okay, and I'll just point out that we don't expect effective solvation numbers to necessarily be anything like the uh, coordination number that you see, for example, in a diffraction experiment. Um, we can set up uh, a series uh, of measurements uh, to determine iron hydration rather than the salt. And salts are, of course, what we must use, but irons are the species that are present in solution, the dominant species, and they are of more interest. Uh, in order to get ionic values, of course, we need some sort of ionic assumption, and the assumption that we <coughs> use is that the chloride ion uh, in water is not strongly solvated and so it has a ZIV of zero and we define it to be zero and then from having defined one uh, ion we can then get all the others from add additivity and if we do then we can build up by additivity a, a quite large set of um, solvation numbers. But whoops, let's just have a slightly closer look at a couple of the ions. Here's uh, the sodium ion down here, uh, and it's relatively weakly solvated, as are all um, monovalent cations. If you go to divalent cations, on the other hand, um, they typically uh, look like this. Copper is an exception. Do we know why? No, we don't. We'll appreciate anybody uh, who can tell us why there is this distinction, but generally speaking, most divalent ion pairs go from around about uh, 15 or so, which suggests that, in fact, divalent metal ions have not one hydration shell, but almost two complete hydration shells. Okay, a little, moving on a little bit further. Sorry, it's got some of the same information, but I wanted to uh, focus your attention on aluminium. Now, aluminium, a 3 plus ion, and a very small one, so with a very high charge to radius ratio. Um, and now, the, uh, now there's even evidence for hydration numbers, that is to say, water molecules that are disappearing from the spectrum because they're sufficiently strongly bound. Now it looks like we can even see something about a third shell. Of course, the third shell 
is not very strongly bound, and that's why you get this dramatic decrease with concentration compared with, say, the 2 plus, and certainly compared with the 1 plus. You'll also see that 1 minus anions, not very strongly solvated. In fact, hydroxide is about the strongest, so all of the uh, other monovalent anions are all down here around zero. Uh, and secondly, uh, in relation to anions, you can see that if you have uh, ions with a larger charge to ratio, charge to radius ratio, like sulfate and carbonate, then you can see that they too have quite strong solvation, second solvation sheets. So much for hydrophilic uh, solvation. Let's have a look at hydrophobic hydration. Uh, and I'll kick that off with this salt, sodium tetraphenyl borate. Um, here, um, you won't see uh, very much uh, from the spectrum, just a, a very large broadening on this side. We know, uh, we know that neither of these ions are going to interact particularly strongly in a hydrophilic sense uh, with water, um, but uh, we can still get this massive change. In fact, you calculate uh, a value not for irrotational bonding now, but for slow water molecules, and we find there are about 60. And we thought, 60? How can it be 60? We must, be, we must have done something stupid. Uh, but when you look at it, in fact, 60 is about the number of water molecules that you can arrange around a tetraphenyl borate ion. And so the number is actually quite meaningful. And what's happening there is that those water molecules are being pushed away from the, tetra, from the hydrophobic tetraphenyl borate ion. Uh, and being pushed onto the water structure, and so they're um, uh, slowing down. There's another theory as well, which I'm not going to. Um, there's some nice systematic results. This is uh, formate acetate propanoate, butanoate, uh, uh, which of course uh, differ from each other by the addition of uh, CH2 group. Formate has no uh, hydrophobic part, so the formate that the, the amount of uh, slow water that we see due to formate is in fact due to weak hydrophilic interaction with the carboxylate group. They all have carboxylate groups, so all of them will have hydrophilic bonding that's about that amount. So all of this increase is due to hydrophobic effect of these groups, and it increases systematically, as you would expect, with the length of the hydrocarbon chain. And uh, I think I've still got a bit of time. Something keeping time. <laughs> uh, the last uh, bit that I want to talk to you about is ionic liquids. Now, some of you may work on ionic liquids. I've worked on ionic liquids. So I don't want you to feel insulted by what I'm about to say, but I'm going to be rude anyway. Okay. So, You've probably read, you may have even written uh, papers about ionic liquids that tell you that ionic liquids are green solvents with amazing properties, wonder solvents that will dissolve anything, solvents with behaviour dominated by ion pairing. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the first one. Uh, I have actually published papers on the toxicity of uh, iron. Uh, of ionic liquids. Uh, certainly many of them, you can make non-toxic ionic liquids, but normal ionic liquids mostly have um, quite strong toxicity. Okay, so what have we found by looking at uh, ionic liquids? Well, uh, as I will show you in a minute, there's not much you can get out of studying pure ionic liquids because you get one spectrum. And it's difficult to deal, to do a lot with one spectrum, although I show you that you still get information. You will remember that I said dielectric relaxation is the only technique for measuring the dielectric constant of a conducting solution. And of course, ionic liquids are conducting. So ionic liquids, in fact, are rather low dielectric constants. So yes, of course, they dissolve organic molecules, just like butanol would which has about the same dielectric constant. 
Now, but, uh, of course, di uh, dielectric constant is not the major factor in determining solubility. It's donor acceptor information, uh, donor acceptor properties. But nevertheless, this tells you when people start telling you about how marvellous uh, ionic liquids are, that they are in fact usually talking about a rather narrow range of molecules. The second major finding uh, of our work on ionic liquids was that there is no evidence from the dielectric spectrum of the existence of discrete ion pairs, of course, on the dielectric time scale. Uh, point out uh, that while it's very easy to claim miraculous properties for things, uh, careful investigation often, often reveals them not to be true. Um, solution chemists have been looking for a analog for water because the properties of water just seem to be so strange that to have an analog would help us to understand. When I first started working in non-aqueous solution chemistry, one of the major reasons for doing so was because we wanted to find out more about what is special about water. And summed up in that saying there, who knows water who only water knows. So if you want to find out something about water, one way of doing it is to look at other solids. And a few years ago, um, uh, a group uh, suggested that the uh, very old, very long discovered ethyl uh, ammonium nitrate had similarities in its far infrared spectra in that technologically difficult area um, due to H bond bending and asymmetric bending modes. Uh, which were, they claimed, exactly like water. There's the spectrum, pretty much the same as the one you saw before. Uh, very big contributions down here at low frequencies and this ongoing contribution. And you'll see that in order to explain that very weak contribution, we need a very complex uh, mathematical model. And what we found was, after a lot of calculations were done, that in fact the mode at 60 centimetres to the minus one is not due to hydrogen bond bending at all, uh, it's due to uh, NO3 vibrations. This is the movement of ions inside a cage, in essence. Uh, and secondly, that the other mode at 190 was due to the vibrations of the cation. So neither of the two features that have been claimed to be water-like, in fact, had anything to do with something that you can relate to water molecules. So the search for water analog continues, which is wonderful for us solution chemistry um, folks. All right, so I think I don't need to go through all of those. What I do need to do is thank you. I thank the organisers for inviting me to make a contribution to this conference, an opening uh, lecture, uh, and thank you all for listening patiently. Thank you. The professor, professor Hector, Hector. Uh, very interesting lecture. I think we can have one short question. Can I ask you something? Okay, I'll just do it. I have been postdoc with Ken Pritzler during. I was a postdoc with Ken Pritzer in uh, 1980 when I was 25 years old and uh, I certainly support the slide that you wrote but in a very modest manner Pritzer cheats because Pritzer used to think always only on one aspect. He used to call us and say this is the polynomial plot. Subtract the d by Huckel terms and what you get fit against molality. So he probably was not very much in, uh, you know, getting into the ion association. Later on, Frank Milro did using the volumetric studies and enthalpies. I just wanted to make a comment. Yes, this is the way he used to think what you said. In my opinion, since I was his student, he always used to think polynomials and nothing else. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk. Yes, I did. I 
didn't want to be rude to, to uh, all the people that do uh, pizza, uh, pizza modelling. I have my name on a number of papers where we use pizza as well. And uh, of course, uh, it's also true to say it's still the best model that we have available for, uh, unfortunately, uh, for correlating. Uh, there's a wonderful statement by uh, Kunz and Noida in, in their book, uh, and something like, in the last 50 years, it has proven easier to put a man on the moon than it has to explain the properties of even a moderately concentrated electrolyte solution without using adjustable parameters. Okay? Uh, because uh, the limitation of time, I think we have to, to talk here. If you have any questions, we can discuss with uh, uh, Garden uh, in the next few days. And now I think I'm very really pleased to uh, please, yeah, on behalf of the organizing committee. I'd like to